forgotten again. Who's going to tell his story? And the irony is that the narrator of the story, the guy who is telling his story, is actually the guy who ends up killing him in the end. Now, here's, here's, here's a little caveat I need to tell you. Most of the time when I talk about movies, I'm not going uh, I'm, I'm to uh, spoil anything that you wouldn't know, uh, you wouldn't find out from the history. Here's the thing. Alexander history, uh, Hamilton, is part of American history. So most of you know he dies in a gunshot fight with uh, Aaron Burr. So those kinds of things I'm not going to hide from you. So I will do my very best not to spoil any, anything major, but um, there's just I'm just going to lay it out according to what you know from history if you paid attention in your history classes. Um, so Aaron Burr kills him, but Aaron Burr's the guy who's telling his story, telling Hamilton's legacy, iron ironically, and he's the last guy that Air Hamilton would have wanted telling him story anyway. So as, as Alexander is in pursuit of his legacy, he realizes that his first break came because of his writing. And so writing becomes his weapon of choice. It becomes the thing that he uses. It's his ticket to fame. And so he writes frantically. He writes um, uh, beyond, I mean, in, it, if most of us saw our kids writing this way, we would probably think that they were writing like they've got a problem. I mean, he was writing and writing and writing frantically, passionately. There's even a song in the play called Nonstop that describes how passionately he writes. And the cast asks, why do you write like you're running out of time? Write day and night like you're running out of time. And if you look at his investment in terms of writing in the rest of uh, the history of his life, the way he wrote his wife, the way he wrote his colleagues, the papers that he submitted to newspapers on behalf of different uh, subjects as our new government was forming, he wrote four and five and 10 times more than anybody else wrote on the subjects. The Federalist Papers, he wrote extravagantly more than, than anybody else. So, as he's writing, the answer comes in the rest of the songs of the play. The songs betray the reason as he, that he's writing so much because they reveal how desperate he is for a legacy and how it guides his life. The third song in the play is called My Shot, and this really becomes his life theme. He says, I'm not going to throw away my shot. He understands that he can't waste the opportunities that he's been given. He sings, uh, don't be shocked when your history book mentions me. I lay down my life if it sets me free. Eventually, you'll see my ascendancy. So you see this arrogance that begins to build in him as he steps in and he gets success as he uses his writing and he gains influence in the new American nation. Um, this song actually is a quote from his life. Uh, he didn't want to waste his shot. And uh, it's an ironic twist on how his life ends as he dies, actually. And if you look at the logo behind me, he's standing there with his hand in the air. That's really the gun as he f uh, shoots, has the shootout with Aaron Burr. Instead of shooting at Aaron Burr, he decides to do the thing of honor, which is to shoot in the air and not take a shot at the vice president. And so he, um, that's actually how he dies. And uh, he doesn't take his shot. So that's the irony of this song. Uh, the fourth and the twelfth songs are actually the same song sung two different ways called The Story of Tonight. And it talks about uh, the cast is singing about uh, you've got these young upstarts that are Lafayette and other parts of uh, pieces of American history that are uh, talking about how future generations will remember what they did. When our children tell our story, they'll tell the story of tonight. And then they talk about Hamilton and they say his enemies destroyed his reputation. America forgot him, which he is one of the least talked about American um, forefathers. And up until the time that this play came out, we were actually in conversations about taking him off the $10 bill because nobody really knew who he was and he wasn't a president. Uh, the song... History has its eyes on you, of course. That's, you can tell that that's about legacy. But George Washington is talking about it. I mean, he's talking to Hamilton. He says, let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I, was a young, when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control who lives, who dies, and who tells your story. And um, later, one last time, is another song uh, deeper in the show where George Washington, as he's stepping down from office, remember, no one had ever stepped out of power before in, in history uh, willingly and walked away. And so as George Washington released the reins of this brand new nation, people, he was thinking of what his legacy and what that would mean. And he says, if I say goodbye, the nation learns to move on. 
it outlives me when I'm gone. Like the scripture says, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make an end, make them afraid. They'll be safe in the nation we've made. I want to sit under my own fig tree, vine and fig tree, a moment alone in the shade at home in this nation we've made. So George Washington, again, thinking about his legacy and challenging Alexander Hamilton that his legacy is not just about power, it's about what we leave behind. The one song that comes much later in the play is called Hurricane, and Hurricane is really where Hamilton recognizes how the tragedy of his childhood and the island being destroyed really symbolizes his life uh, at that point when it's been revealed that he's had an adulterous affair and it's really destroyed his life. Um, his wife is questioning him, his, you know, his career is at stake. And back uh, when he is back on the island, he decides, he discovers, he says, he wrote his way out of poverty. The way he got out of it was by writing. And so he decides that the way to get out of this hurricane in his life is to write his way out of it. Writing has always been the answer to his troubles. So let me write again and reveal it. And that's what we call, uh, there's a set of papers that came out about his affair. It's the first sex uh, affair in American politics. And it's about Alexander Hamilton. And he published a hundred page paper on an affair that he had had with a, a lady in town and he had been bribed to honor. So he goes, he writes, he sings, I'll write my way out, overwhelm them with honesty. This is the eye of the hurricane. This is the only way I can protect my legacy. He feels like that's the way to protect his legacy. His first response to the sin in his life is to explain it away, take control of the negative narrative and make sure that he's the one that is telling his story. Well, of course, you have his wife, Eliza, who is a sweet, godly woman. And uh, this, in the song, Burn, that comes right after Hurricane, she's deciding that history doesn't get a, isn't going to get the opportunity to um, see her reaction. So she burns all of his love letters, all the evidence of their correspondence and how she would have reacted because she he knows history is watching what they're doing. And so she's going to write herself out of history in silence. So we know really nothing about how she reacted, but she sings in this song. I'm erasing myself from the narrative. Let future historians wonder how Eliza reacted when her, you broke her heart. You have torn it all apart. I'm watching it burn, watching it burn. The world has no right to my heart. The world has no right to our bed. They don't get to know what I said. I'm burning the memories. And then in the end of the song, Eliza also sings, or at the end of the play, she also sings another song called Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Her Story. And she sings, every other founding father's story gets told. Every other founding father gets to grow old. And when my time is up, have I done enough? Will they tell your story? But then when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? Alexander Hamilton immigrants, orphan. He writes his place literally into American history and in, onto our $10 bills. You, you forget what he looks like, just pull a $10 bill out of your wallet. He too, just like Icarus, and the play talks about him being Icarus, his sister-in-law calls him the Icarus, who due to his pride and arrogance, he made these wings and he decides he's going to fly up to the sun and, the, and it gets too close and the wings melt. But uh, just like Icarus, uh, he comes crashing down. His pride takes him up. He comes crashing down tragically with the loss of his son, uh, almost uh, the loss of his wife and the loss of his career. It, it's, it's, a it's a tragic tale if that's where the story ends. But there is far more to the story than just the tragedy. During his childhood in the Caribbean, he developed a very deep Christian faith. And it was fostered as a teen at King's College. And his roommate often talked about what a great and fervent prayer he was. His faith wavered, though, during his political career. And we've seen that as we studied dominion. How many of these kings start out well, those that are given dominion, start out well. And as they gain dominion, but the closer they get to the sun, the closer they get to power, uh, their faith begins to melt like the wax in his wings. According to the play, his faith was restored after the death of one of his children, when he can no longer control the narrative, he realizes that he can't write himself out of this anymore. And the song that they sing is called It's Quiet Uptown. And it shows his struggle through the loss and how his faith deepens. He sings, I take the children to church on Sunday, a sign of the cross at the door, and I, play, and I pray. That never used to happen. And so Alexander returns to the faith of his youth 
And he once said, I have carefully examined the evidences. This isn't in the play. This is just a quote by him. I've carefully examined the evidences of the Christian religion. And if I were sitting as a juror upon its authenticity, I would unhesitatingly give my verdict in its favor. I can prove its truth as clearly as any proposition ever submitted to the mind of man. Once he is restored with God, he seeks the restoration with his wife. The same song ends with the chorus singing, see them walking in the park long after dark, taking in the sights of the city. Look around, look around, Eliza. They're trying to do the unimaginable. Forgiveness. Can you imagine? Forgiveness. Can you imagine if you see him on the street, walking by her side, talking by her side, have pity. They're going through the unimaginable. The song ends with them walking hand in hand as an expression of the restoration of their relationship. Legacy begins with your relationship with God and his forgiveness and flows now from there into the rest of the relationships in your life. So now what? Alexander Hamilton was not a perfect man. We know that. It's clear from history that he was not. And yet, at the same time, he was a man of deep faith. In fact, he reminds me a lot of some of their prolific writers in scripture. King David, for example, who, by the way, had a similar problem with uh, adulterous and adulterous an affair. And King David wrote uh, poetry as well, just like Hamilton did. And uh, after his affair with Bathsheba, he wrote in Psalm 51, beginning at verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned. Think about that for a moment. David cheated on a man uh, on, with his wife. So, but David said, my primary sin, the primary sin was against you, God. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. But he continues down in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. David's son, Solomon, also, right? Similar kinds of issue. The more he got dominion, the more power he got, the more famous he got, the more you know, people talked about his wisdom, uh, the more he struggled. And he struggled also with the ladies, and he was also a prolific writer. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, beginning at verse 13, says, his wisdom, his advice, Solomon's advice is, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. With every secret thing, whether good or evil, God's going to bring it out. So deal with it. Your first, your first account, like his father did, was take it to the Lord against you and you alone have I sinned. Hamilton not only wrote uh, poetry, he also wrote a hymn. I don't know if anybody have you ever sung the hymn, but the final phrase in the hymn goes, O Lamb of God, thrice gracious Lord, now, now I feel how true thy word, translated to this happy place, this blessed vision of thy face. My soul shall all thy steps attend in songs of triumph without end. So the question comes back to each of us in our now what today. How do you deal with your sin? Do you have peace with God. After the duel, uh, not in the play, but in real life, as Alexander lays dying, his very last request is that he would be able to take communion. And the Episcopal priest knew that he had had a duel, which was considered a mortal sin, so he said, no way. But he, he actually left, and he wouldn't come back until the next day. People begged him to come back, and he came back because they had convinced him, and Alexander had finally convinced him that he was repentant and has, had returned his heart to his Lord. The legacy that we all want is echoed in the words of Jesus in the parable of the talents. When the master returns and he only found one of his servants to be faithful in Matthew chapter 25, verse one, 21. And the master says to his servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little and I, set over you, I will set over you much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
This is the legacy we all want, to hear the Lord say at the end of the day, no matter what we have accomplished, no matter what titles we have, no matter what it is, we all want to hear the Lord say, right? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Legacy begins now. It begins with your relationship to God and flows to your other relationships. It's not about you. It's not about you. Once you let go of your legacy, then you can truly embrace the plan of God in your life and to accomplish the things that he sets aside for you, your real legacy. So some of us, you may be wrestling with a broken relationship and you're working so hard to get it restored and you're not having any success. And I challenge you with Alexander's example that you start with your relationship with Jesus first. Build on your relationship with him. If you seek me, you will find me. Seek the Lord with all of your heart, and he will give your desires to you, Psalm 37 says. You may have been hurt by someone. Guess what? You may have been hurt by someone unimaginably. Unimaginably. And they have broken your heart, not just emotionally. They may have hurt you physically. They are, as long as you allow them to have control over you, you continue to be a victim. But if you start with Jesus first, Turn to Jesus first. Turn to your faith first. Treat them the way God treated you. How did God, our sins are nothing. None of us have done anything. Uh, No one has done anything to you compared to what we've done to Jesus and the way that we rebelled against him. Biographers tell us that Eliza was always the one who had a constant faith. And it was her faith that gave her the courage to be able to turn and grab Alexander Hamilton's hand and continue to walk with him the rest of the days of his life. In fact, beyond that, uh, Eliza spent the last 50 years of her life redeeming Alexander's legacy. She started an orphanage that exists today. It's over 200 years old for other kids who, like Alexander, are orphans. And in the final song she sings, in their eyes, I see you, Alexander. I see you every time. Any child can leave a legacy, an orphan to remember an orphan. So she spends the rest of her life. She was able to completely forgive and be restored in her relationship with him because of her faith. So here it is. What is your legacy? What are, what are you leaving behind? Are you out to prove that, you know, you're going to build a, a monument to yourself? And I would challenge you, build a monument to Jesus first and let the rest of it take care of itself. Let the arrogance go, the self-pursuit go, your own agenda, or your, you know, pursue God's agenda for your life, the things that he wants to accomplish in you. You know, one of the things that, that um, this play has done is there have been people who didn't feel like they were worth it. They didn't have courage. They didn't have strength. They didn't have smarts. They didn't have whatever it was they didn't have. And this play has been an inspiration to thousands of people that if God can use a, an immigrant child um, with an orphan, with nothing to his name, then maybe he could use them. Then maybe despite all the things that had happened to their lives, maybe he can use me. And maybe that's you. Maybe God it can, um, if you're able to let that go, God then will be able to use you in the way he wants you to use, be used for his glory and for his kingdom rather than for ours. We're going to go into a time of worship again. And uh, if you'd like to talk to someone, pray with someone, go ahead and um, let us know in the chat room and we'll make sure to get back to you. Here we go.